One of them on this Thanksgiving evening said this, Even though I clutch my blanket and growl when the alarm clock rings each morning, thank you, Lord, that I can hear. There are those who are deaf. Even though I keep my eyes tightly closed against the morning light as long as possible, thank you, Lord, that I can see there are many who are blind. Even though the first hours of the day is hectic, when (laughs) socks are lost, toast is burned, tempers are short, thank you, Lord, for my family. There are many who are lonely. Even though our breakfast table never looks like the pictures on the ladies' magazines and the menu is at times unbalanced, thank you, Lord, for the food we have. There are many who are hungry. Even though the routine of my job is often monotonous, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work. There are many who have no work. Even though I grumble and bemoan my fate from day to day and wash and wish my modest circumstances were not quite so modest, thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. And I think that in many ways that that sums up really what we have Thanksgiving for, what Thanksgiving is really all about. When you go back and you remember the first Thanksgiving we had in America, you have to remember it was the pilgrims who'd come to America in search of religious freedom, uh, who'd sailed across the seas, who'd landed on Cape Cod, who'd then found nothing but a barren uh, finger of land uh, stretching out from the coastline, who'd relocated then to Plymouth, and who set up a communal society where all men worked together for the common good on, on communal land. And as a result of it, the crops were poor. Because you see, when everybody's working for the common good, nobody's working for themselves. And the attitude is just, well, let somebody else do it. Like the story of the little red hen. You remember that when you were a child? And who will help me um, to plant the food? Who will help me to, to reap the wheat? Who will help me to... Uh, Uh, grind the wheat, who will help me to make the flour, who will help me to bake the bread. Uh, And no one really wanted to be involved. And that's really the story of people. Communism, communal uh, work, just usually doesn't work unless with a strong religious motivation, perhaps as a kibbutz in Israel and a monastery. But these ideas of collectivism and socialism, (laughs) they're totally irrational. They're simply used really by by the elitist as a vehicle to get the suckers to want something for nothing, and eventually, after they've given up their freedom, they find the other side of the coin is tyranny. And so as you look more and more to government or to any community for support, you'll find eventually you'll lose your freedom. And so it was that after the first uh, winter in, in Plymouth, a large number of the people who had made up the Plymouth colony had died. And the following spring, Governor Bradford, who headed the Plymouth colony, said, what we have is a system that doesn't work. And so he gave each man... Uh, a plot of land and said, you farm that land, you are responsible for it, and you, and you alone, will benefit from what has grown there. And you know, it was the most amazing thing. Why, by the following day, by the following uh, fall, there was a bountiful harvest. And Thanksgiving was to thank God for that bountiful harvest. And uh, that's what Thanksgiving was all about. It was to thank God for the for the harvest and for the wonderful blessings that he had given these people in this land. And then found the secret. Not communal living, but each man owning a piece of land, farming that piece of land, developing that piece of land. That then became the basis of the American enterprise system. And, of course, what was so wonderful about America is that there was so much land out there for people to have. And if they were willing to homestead it, if they were willing to work it, or they were willing to develop it, every man could have land and could have freedom from... uh, tyranny that was imposed by government, as it had been on the European continent, where land was very tightly held by by the feudal landowners, by the lords, by the aristocracy in all the countries of Europe. <clears throat> and it was this idea of freedom under God that gave birth to the American concepts of individual freedom. It was when King George of England began wanting to tax the people and take away their freedom and house his soldiers in their homes and take away their property rights and search their homes without warrants it was at this point that the, the people, many of them coming from an English tradition, said, you know, freedom is more important. We don't want the security of, of, of the British Empire protecting us. We want to be free as individual citizens. And you know the story of the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence is really a wonderful story uh, and perhaps should be retold at this time because the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were really very wealthy people. They were the major landowners. They were the... Uh, the, the wealthy people of, of the colonies, uh, there were 55 of them. 
Each one of them had security under the British rule. But they felt that liberty was far more important than security. And when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they risked their lives. They had come out in treason uh, against the British government. If they failed, they would all be hung. And usually the British were not uh, very kind to people. They usually tortured them horribly. That was the English tradition. Uh, not simply hanging people, but torturing them before they, before they hung them. And, and so it was that, as Benjamin Franklin said, if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. But the 55 men who signed the Declaration of Independence did that because they believed with all their heart in this idea that liberty was far more important than security. But as you remember what the Declaration of Independence said, it, it was carrying on this tradition of a belief in God. It talked about, uh, in, in the preamble, when in the time of human events it becomes necessary for one nation to separate it from itself from another uh, in order to pursue uh, uh, the, the rules of nature's God, of nature's law. Uh, then it, uh, and then it goes on to talk about all men being created equal. It talked about the supreme ruler of the um, universe. And then it concluded you know, with these men saying, you know, and we mutually uh, uh, pledged to one another our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. But before it said that, it said but with reliance upon divine providence, we mutually pledge to one another our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And so four times in the Declaration of Independence, they made reference to their allegiance to God as the, the, the source of the liberty that they hoped to have. And so it was that America was created as a nation after the Revolutionary War. And time and again, you'll find in the wonderful stories of the Revolutionary War, the tremendous dedication of the Founding Fathers of America to deep religious goals and objectives. But tragically through the years, there has been a move by people who wish to do away with liberty and establish an authoritarian rule and who realized that the most important thing that they could do was simply to remove the religious foundations of America. For if you could remove the religious foundations of America and have people look to government for their security rather than to God, then you could destroy this, this wonderful dream, this experiment in liberty that had been created in America unlike any other nation that had ever existed throughout all history. And one thing we should be thankful for tonight is the fact that we are Americans and we have a proud heritage. Tragically, we're losing that heritage because so many Americans have come to believe that it is the function of government to provide for us, to provide for the people who are sick, who are to provide for the people who are needy, never realizing that the American tradition was that that provision was to come from the local community, first of all, from the individual, secondly, from the family, third, from the church, and lastly, from the local city or from the local county, which was the basic unit of, of our society. It was from there that the provision for the needy and for the sick was to come, not from the national government. For all of our founding fathers, certainly Thomas Jefferson among them, recognized that when all power had been centralized in Washington, D.C., that we would have a tyranny equally as brutal as that that we had recently escaped from. And you've heard me mention this and read this before, but let me read it to you again from Thomas Jefferson, The Master Thoughts of Thomas Jefferson. It has long been my opinion, and I've never shrunk from its expression, that the germ of dissolution of our federal government is in the constitution of our federal judiciary, an irresponsible body, for impeachment is scarcely a scarecrow, working like gravity by night and by day, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow and advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the field of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped from the states and the government of all shall be consolidated into one. To this I am opposed because when all government, domestic and foreign, in little as in great things shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks of one government on another and will become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we just recently separated. And so the founding fathers of America realized that the move towards centralization of all power in government was the road to the loss of freedom. But the loss of freedom would go along with our turning our backs on our God and our religious beliefs. Well, this evening, I'm going to, I think, read you uh, briefly from uh, the latest issue of the Machiavelli Intelligence Report, because it's always worthwhile. And uh, we'll just give you a little of his introductory remarks, and then I think I'll read to you from a treatise I've just completed called the Foundations, the Network, and, the, and their Secret Agenda. And when you understand this, you will understand 
everything that is going on in America today. In fact, let me just do that rather than getting to McIlvenny. And then we'll open up, we'll, we'll read this, and I think I can read it probably in 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes at the most. And then if you have any questions or comments and you really want to explore any of these ideas, you give me a call here at 464-8295. But we won't take any calls until I've gotten through this. Now, we start out with a quotation. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, heard the heavens filled with shouting, and there rained a ghastly dew from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue, till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World. Lord Alfred Tennyson, who lived from 1809 till 1892. The dedication of the book is dedicated to the hundreds of thousands of young Americans who have needlessly given their lives during the 20th century, fighting in the First and the Second World Wars in Korea and Vietnam, Beirut and Panama, Kuwait and Somalia, believing that they were fighting for freedom, never realizing that they were simply being used as cannon fodder to further the goals of those within the network who believed in the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World. This book is dedicated to the 40 to 60 million men and women who perished in the Ukraine and in the frozen wastes of Siberia under successive communist regimes, regimes that were, were covertly supported by Western industrialists and the network. This book is dedicated to the 60 to 80 million people who died under the tyranny of Chinese communist regimes, which were covertly brought to power by policies of the Western elite and supported even after Tiananmen Square, by successive American presidents who extended most favored nation treaty status to ruthless communist tyrants. This book is dedicated to the unnumbered millions who have suffered and bled and starved and ultimately died in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Somalia, Iraq, Iran, Mozambique, Angola, Rhodesia, Algeria, South Africa, the Sudan, and countless other nations. But this book is also dedicated to that small but growing number of American patriots who have come to understand the spiritual nature of the struggle facing Western civilization, a spiritual battle being waged on an ideological and political battlefield. These patriots recognize that freedom comes from God, not from government, and that liberty and limited government are synonymous while tyranny and total government are synonymous. They recognize that America is moving rapidly towards a fascist state under a world government in which the people will be disarmed and then provided for and controlled by technocrats from the cradle to the grave. Many of these patriots have committed their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor, as did our forefathers of old in an effort to expose the foundations, the network, and their secret agenda. Then return America to its former greatness as a nation under God's blessing. Chapter 1. The Secret Agenda, the Dream, the Reality. Your life is about to change forevermore. Once you've completed reading this book, you'll never again look at the world through the same eyes. Have you ever wondered what's really happening in America? It almost seems as if there's a specter haunting our nation, and that specter grows ever darker and ever more ominous. Indeed, the whole world seems to be changing. There's a vague uneasiness across our land. It's ill-defined, but most Americans sense its presence. Deep down, most of us recognize that something is seriously wrong. America, the beacon of liberty, the land of opportunity, the hope of the world, America seems to be faltering. Our leaders no longer speak of our declaration of independence. Rather, they speak of America's interdependence. Our leaders seldom refer to our Republican form of government. Rather, they, <clears throat> they speak of America as a democracy. Our leaders seldom speak of the importance of strengthening America's economy. <clears throat> Rather, they speak of the importance of the globe. <coughs> Pardon me, of the global economy. Our leaders seldom speak of America's sovereignty. Rather, they speak of the necessity of a new world order. It doesn't seem to matter whether we elect Democrats or Republicans to office. Both parties seem to embrace the same foreign and domestic policies. Is this happening by accident, or is there some hidden force, some secret agenda. When candidate Bill Clinton accepted the Democratic nomination for the President of the United States, he stated, As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. And then as a student at Georgetown, I heard the call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley, 
who said to us that America was the greatest nation in history because our people have always believed in two things, that tomorrow can be better than today and that every one of us has a personal moral responsibility to make it so. Now, who was Professor Quigley? Why were Professor Quigley's words, which I just read, which really don't make much sense, so important to Bill Clinton that he mentioned the professor on the most important day of his political career? What information did Professor Quigley impart to Bill Clinton when he was a student at Georgetown University? Can it be that the professor played an important part in shaping Bill Clinton's career? Did the professor tell Clinton secrets that could propel him from Georgetown University to Oxford University to the governorship of Arkansas and then into the White House? Now, I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton of the secret international Anglophile network which controlled the governments of the United States and England and other English-speaking countries. This network worked through banking corporations, the media, and the great tax-exempt foundations. Their efforts were coordinated through the Council on Foreign Relations in America, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, and similar organizations in other lands. I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that the secret group started at Oxford in the 1870s under the tutelage of a Professor John Ruskin. Ruskin indoctrinated a generation of British youth to believe in world government, that is, the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World. Professor Ruskin was a disciple of Plato, the Greek philosopher, who wrote of the creation of a world utopia in his classic, The Republic. Ruskin, in turn, we believe that a ruling oligarchy should gain control of the common people in order to create a modern-day utopia. Ruskin advocated a socialist world state under a ruling elite. I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that Ruskin's most famous student was a young man named Cecil Rhodes, and after leaving Oxford, Rhodes journeyed to South Africa and there gained control of the vast wealth from the gold and diamond mines and then used his fortune to fund the Rhodes Scholarships. The Rhodes Scholarship was created in order to bring young men from across the world to Oxford where they'd be schooled in the philosophy of the ruling elite and then sent back to their respective countries to further the cause of the network to build the kingdom of heaven here upon this earth. <clears throat> I further believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that Cecil Rhodes had created the secret society which had been instrumental in creating the Boer War. The secret society subsequently formed the Round Table in England, a group which was instrumental in fomenting and then needlessly prolonging the carnage of the First World War. And after the First World War, the Round Table spoiled the, spawned the Royal Institute of International Affairs through the Commonwealth and the Council of Foreign Relations in America. In the years between the First and Second World Wars, the network actively supported Adolf Hitler and encouraged his expansionist policies in Europe. I further believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that the network actively worked with the great foundations in America to suppress the truth of their involvement in creating both world wars, the wars in Korea and Vietnam, and to maintain the myth that American soldiers had been fighting for freedom overseas. The truth of the matter was that the Boer War, the First and Second World Wars, the Korean War and the war in Vietnam were all fought to create the world government that the Anglophile network dreamed of, first the League of Nations, than the United Nations. I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that the invisible rulers of the world were really very kind and considerate men who dreamed a dream, a dream of creating a better world. Sometimes they made mistakes by backing leaders like Adolf Hitler and Mao and Lenin, but the members of the network never meant to do harm. I further believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that an Anglophile network worked in America in both the Democratic and Republican parties and on both sides of the political spectrum, both the right and the left. The network even infiltrated the Communist Party and used the party to further the network's socialist goals. At times, organizations that the network created, such as the Institute of Pacific Relations, were unduly influenced by Kremlin policies. In the case of the Institute of Pacific Relations, their influence was used to manipulate American government policies towards China policies that led directly to the fall of China to communism. But that was simply a mistake. It wasn't supposed to have happened. Professor Quigley, of course, failed to mention the 60 to 80 million people who were ruthlessly killed, executed in China because of the network's mistake. Why? Oh, because members of the network were really very nice men who sincerely wanted to make a better world. Criticism of the mistakes was simply unjustified. I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton how the great foundations were used to change America, that the wealth of the industrialists was being used to destroy the free enterprise system and bring about an authoritarian socialist state under network control. And lastly, 
I believe that Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton that if he really wanted to be successful, he should become a Rhodes Scholar and go to Oxford University, then come to back to America and join the Council on Foreign Relations. That was the way to success. That was the path to power. That was the road to the presidency. Now, why do I believe these things? Well, I've personally spoken with a number of Carol Quigley students, and the professor always told his students about the network and its goal of building the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And then in 1980, I went back to Georgetown University on a number of occasions, and I personally went through Carol Quigley's private papers in the university archives. To my knowledge, I was the first person to study those papers after his death. I was able to glean tremendous insight into his research and beliefs. Indeed, I purchased a taped interview with Carol Quigley from his widow, in which the professor tells how his publisher, Macmillan, destroyed the plates for his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, so that his book could not be reprinted. Copies of that tape are available from Radio Liberty. However, most of the information on, on what I believe Professor Quigley taught Bill Clinton can be found in the professor's book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, published by Macmillan in 1967. What follows are the words of Professor Carol Quigley, who is Bill Clinton's mentor. In quotation marks, there does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way that the radical right believes the Communist Act. In fact, this network has no aversion to cooperating with the Communists or any other group and frequently does so. I know of the operation of this network because I've studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or most of its aims and have, for much of my life, been close to it and many of its instruments. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. <clears throat> At each point now, we'll give you uh, page references to the book. We won't give those um, in the reading what was their design? What was their goal? In quotation marks, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of every country and the economy of the world as a whole. Their system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, a privately owned bank controlled by the world's central banks, which were then themselves private corporations. And then he goes on to say, they sought to dominate governments by their ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchange, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. And I comment, in other words, that purchase the allegiance of politicians who then support their agenda. That's what he's saying. And then Professor Quigley goes on to say the English branch of this English establishment, pardon me, the American branch of this English establishment exerted much of its influence through five American newspapers, the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune, Christian Science Monitor, the Washington Post, and the lamented Boston Evening Transcript. My comment is that by 1993, the network controlled all three major television networks, as well as 90 to 95 percent of the major newspapers and magazines in America. Thus, both the liberal and supposedly conservative press could be used to conceal the existence of the network. Professor Quigley, on this basis, there grew up in the 20th century, had been brought into the Morgan firm as straight was several years later by Henry P. Davison, a Morgan partner from 1909. Each had a wife who became a patroness of leftist causes, and two sons, of which the elder was a conventional banker and the younger was a left-wing sympathizer and sponsor. In fact, all of the evidence would indicate that Tom Lamont was simply Morgan's apostle to the left. In succession to straight, a change made necessary by the latter's premature death in 1918. Both were financial supporters of liberal publication, in Lamont's case, the Saturday Review of Literature, which he supported through the 1920s and 30s, and the New York Post, which he owned from 1918 to 1924. The chief evidence, however, can be found in the files of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which show Tom Lamont and his wife, Florida, and his son, Corliss, as sponsors and financial angels to almost a score of extreme left-wing organizations, including the Communist Party itself. Among these, we need mention only two. One of these was a Communist Front organized uh, organization, the Trade Union Services Incorporated, in New York City, which in 1947 published 15 trade union papers for various CIO unions. 
Among his officers were Corliss Lamont and Frederick Vanderbilt Field, another link between Wall Street and the Communists. The latter was on the editorial boards of the official communist newspaper in New York, The Daily Worker, as well as its magazine, The New Masses, and was the chief link between the communists and the Institute of the Pacific Relations between 1928 and 1947. Corliss Lamont was the leading light in another communist organization which started life in the 1920s as the Friends of the Soviet Union, but by 1943 was recognized with Lamont as chairman of the board and chief incorporator of the National Council of American Soviet Friendship. During this whole period of over two decades, Corliss Lamont, who was Tom Lamont's son, with the full support of his parents, was one of the chief figures in fellow travelers' circles and one of the chief spokesmen for the Soviet point of view, both in these organizations and also in connections which came to him either as son of the most influential man in Wall Street or as a professor of philosophy at Columbia University. In January of 1946, Corliss Lamont was called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities to give testimony on the National Council of American Soviet Friendship. He refused to produce records, was subpoenaed, refused, was charged with contempt of Congress, and so cited by the House of Representatives June 26, 1946. The adverse publicity continued, yet when Tom Lamont rewrote his will on January 6, 1948. Corliss Lamont remained in it as co-heir of his father's fortune of scores of millions of dollars. I go to comment, after the fall of Eastern Europe and China to communism, it became obvious that powerful forces working at the highest echelons of our government had helped to defeat the forces of liberty and impose communism on the peoples of Eastern Europe and China. Professor Quigley. In 1951, the Subcommittee on Internal Security of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the so-called McCarran Committee, sought to show that China had been lost to the communists by the deliberate action of a group of academic experts on the Far East and communist fellow travelers whose work in that direction was controlled and coordinated by the Institute of Pacific Relations. The influence of the communists in the IPR is well established, but the patronage of Wall Street is less well known. Once the anger and suspicion of the American people was aroused, uh, as they were by 1950, it was a fairly simple matter to get rid of the Red Sympathizers. Before this could be done, however, a congressional committee followed backward to their source the threads which led from admitted communists like Whitaker Chambers to Alger Hess and the Carnegie Endowment to Thomas Lamont and the Morgan Bank. And then it fell into a whole complicated network of the interlocking tax-exempt foundations. The 83rd Congress in July 1953 set up a special committee to investigate tax exempt foundations with Representative B. Carol Reese of Tennessee as chairman. It soon became clear that people of immense wealth would be very unhappy if the investigation went too far and that the most respected newspapers in the country closely allied with these men of wealth would not get excited enough about any revelation to make the publicity really worthwhile in terms of votes or campaign contributions. And obviously what Professor Quigley was saying is that the most respected newspapers in the United States would suppress the information on the Foundation's involvement in the network's activities, which they did, of course. The Congressional Committee report was ignored by the American media, which even by 1954 was almost totally under the control of the network. Professor Quigley goes on to say, an interesting report showed the left-wing association of the interlocking nexus of tax-exempt foundations. It was issued in 1954 rather quietly. Four years later, the Reese Committee, the General Counsel, Rennie Warmser, wrote a shocked but not shocking book on the subject called Foundations, Their Power and Influence. Now, the second chapter is simply an overview of that book, The Foundations, Their Power and Their Influence. In the foreword of the book, Congressman Reese stated that the purpose of the congressional investigation in 1953 and 1954, his committee had sought to determine, and this is his remark in quotation marks, to what extent, if any, are the funds of the large foundations aiding and abetting Marxist tendencies in the United States and weakening the love which every American should have for his way of life. Preface, pages 5 and 6. Many Warmser, the committee counsel, quotes John O'Donnell writing in the New York Daily News, December 21, 1954, saying that the Reese Committee had the almost impossible task of telling the taxpayers of America that the incredible was in fact the truth. The huge fortunes filed up by such industrial giants as John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and Henry Ford were being used to destroy or discredit the free enterprise system which had given them birth. 
an elite had thus emerged in control of gigantic financial resources operating outside of our democratic process, which is willing and able to shape the future of this nation and of mankind in the image of its own value concepts. Now the book goes on to say that Louis Brandeis, later to become Justice of the Supreme Court, is quoted as having testified on June 23, 1915, before the Walsh Committee, as to why he was gravely concerned with the growth of concentrated economic power. And this is what he said. But when a great financial power is developed, when there exist these powerful organizations which can successfully summon forces from all parts of the country, there develops within the state a state so powerful that the ordinary social and industrial forces existing are insufficient to cope with it. The committee report goes on to show that a small number of wealthy and powerful financiers held in their hands the financial control of American industry. That control to actual stock ownership, or though actual stock ownership in, uh, in spite of large numbers of st stockholders rested with a very small number of persons, and that in each great basic industry, a small, pardon me, a single large corporation dominated the market. The Walsh Committee, which had preceded the Reese Committee, pointed out that the foundations had used their power to force sectarian universities and colleges to give up their religious affiliations in order to gain funds. Thus, the religious infrastructure of our society was progressively eroded by the foundations. Progressive education was financed in teachers' colleges, a system of education that eventually has led to the undermining of the American educational system and to 90 million illiterates in America. And the report goes on to say, a minority of foundations have fallen victim to the obsession for social change, but among this minority are to be found some of the wealthiest and some of the oldest endowments. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has reached into the Department of State, into the law schools, where international law is taught, into the foreign offices of other nations, into the United Nations, and its associated organizations. The Rockefeller Foundation supported the National Research Council's Committee for Research in Problems of Sex, which led to the Kinsey Report, the report that would change the sexual mores of our society and lead to the skyrocketing divorce rate, with over half of American marriages ending in divorce, the skyrocketing illegitimacy rate, and the astronomical level of sexual, sexually transmitted diseases, all traceable directly back to the Kinsey Report, which is financed by the Rockefeller Foundation grants. Here and after is a list of the subjects covered by the Reese Committee and recorded in foundations, their power and influence. How rich banking and industrial families gave vast sums of money to foundations while continuing to control their funds. How the major American foundations were interlocked into a monolithic monopoly to create a world government. How the foundations used their grants to take over control of the social science teachings in the major universities how social scientists came to be used as a political instrument, how the foundations destroyed the careers of social scientists who disagreed with or criticized foundation policies, how the foundations developed an elite core of social engineers intent upon remaking the world along socialist lines, how the foundation sponsored the Kinsey Report, deliberately designed to destroy social mores in America and lead to our sexual revolution, how the foundations used social science to undermine the disciplinary structure of the American military, how they employed a Marxist socialist scholar to write a book designed to promote socialism, how they imported a Swedish socialist, Gunnar Myrdal, Maidral, to write a study on the American Negro. His writings were intended to create racial discord in America and have succeeded in that goal how they financed the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, a vehicle for the promotion of socialism, how the foundations funded a Marxist elite and academic social science circles, how the foundations funded books which continually emphasized injustice and problems in American society in order to discredit our culture, how the foundations used their funds to subvert and control American education, how they used grants shaped the views of teachers, either teachers conform to foundation policies or they received no grants for research how the foundations funded the birth of educational radical radicalism, how the Carnegie Foundation funded a socialist charter for education, subsidized radical educators, funded Progressive Education Association, funded and supported socialist textbooks, financed left-wing reference works, how the foundations funded the National Educational Association designed to undermine traditional American education, how the tax-exempt tax foundations were used as instruments of subversion, the funding of both communist and socialist influences, 
in foundations, how the foundations funded studies that ridiculed the American concept of free markets and free enterprise, how the socialists received voluminous foundation support in launching their League for Industrial Democracy, the American extension of the British Fabian Socialist Movement, how they pushed a long-range program to radicalize the American labor movement, got jobs for communists and socialists, had policies to promote world government, how Rhodes Scholars were fed into the government services by the foundations, how the Carnegie Foundation used its funds to promote American involvement in the First World War, how the foundations financed international relation clubs to promote socialism, internationalism, and speakers such as communist Alger Hiss, how the Foreign Policy Association was used as an instrument of opinion molding for the left, how history books were rewritten to keep Americans from learning the truth about our history, how the foundations promoted the United Nations so that it could be used by the socialist communist coalition to work towards world government. Now, you may ask if all this is true, if all this is in the book that you're describing, why has no public figure come forward to expose the foundations, the network, and the secret agenda? Well, the truth of the matter is many have, but the remarks have been suppressed. Professor Charles Austin Beard the most eminent historian of America in the 1930s and 1950s wrote of the efforts of the Rockefeller Foundation and the CFR to suppress the facts surrounding America's involvement in the Second World War, and this appeared in the Saturday Evening Post shortly before it, uh, it went down and no longer got advertisers and uh, uh, disappeared for a time from the scene, and then was, the name was picked up by somebody else. But <clears throat> when magazines print the truth, they don't last too long in America. The Rockefeller Foundation said... Charles Austin Beard, and the Council on Foreign Relations intended to prevent a repetition of what they called in the vernacular the debunking journalistic campaign following World War I, translated into precise English. This means that the foundations and the council do not want journalists or any other person to examine too closely and criticize too freely the official propaganda and official statements relative to our basic aims and activities during World War II. Now, Professor Harry Elmer Barnes wrote extensively on the foundations and their censorship of historians who tried to tell the truth about America's involvement in the Second World War in his book, Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace. Barry Goldwater described the network in his book with no apologies, pages 278-279. I believe the Council on Foreign Relations and its ancillary elitist groups are indifferent to communism. They have no ideological answer. In their pursuit of a new world order, they're prepared to deal without prejudice with a communist state, a socialist state, a democratic state, monarchy, oligarchy. It's all the same to them. And then Goldwater quoted Admiral Chester Ward, who had been a member of the CFR for 16 years, and Ward had said, This most powerful clique in these elitist groups have one objective in common. They want to bring about the surrender of the sovereignty and the national independence of the United States. Perry Goldwater went on to say their goal is to impose a benign stability on the quarreling family of nations through merger and consolidation. They see the elimination of national boundaries, the suppression of racial and ethnic loyalties, as the most expeditious avenue to world peace. It may be that if the CFR vision of the world could be realized, there would be a reduction in wars, lessening of poverty, in my mind. This would inevitably be accompanied by a loss of personal freedom of choice and the reestablishment of the restraints which provoked the American Revolution. Professor Arthur S. Miller, a Rockefeller Foundation-funded scholar, describes America's secret establishment in his book, The Secret Constitution and the Need for Constitutional Change. The book's published by one of the network publishers, House, and is directed exclusively to members of the network. In fact, it's only a little over a quarter of an inch thick, maybe half an inch of the most, $41 to get it. Difficult to get. But this is what he says. As for the United States, it seems clear beyond doubt that we've always had an elitist form of actual government, however much the popular wisdom, wisdom is to the contrary. Great family wealth as well as corporate wealth has long exercised more influence in American government than has been generally realized. In other words, those who formally rule take their signals and commands not from the electorate as a body, but from a small group of men plus a few women. This group will be called the establishment. I call it the network. It exists even though that existence is stoutly denied. It is one of the secrets of the American social order. A second secret is the fact that the existence of the establishment, the ruling class, is not supposed to be discussed. A third secret is implicit in what has been said 
that there is really only one political party of any consequence in the United States, one that has been called the property party. The Republicans and the Democrats are, in fact, two branches of that same secret party. Major General Smedley Butler, former commandant of the American Marine Corps, wrote of the use of American military force to impose the controls of the network and their banking and corporate allies on helpless peoples throughout the world, killing and murdering to further the secret agenda. It was their goal to pursue evil, to accomplish good. And this is what the general said. I spent 33 years and four months in active service as a member of our country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. Thus, I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking Boys of Brown Brothers in 1909 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American Food Company in 1903. And in 1927 in China, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. Philip Kerr became a leader of the network after the Boer War. He played an important part in keeping England in the First World War and in supporting Hitler's expansionist plans in the 1930s. Writing in Foreign Affairs magazine, the official publication of the CFR in 1922, he said, There's going to be no steady progress in civilization or self-government among the more backward peoples until some kind of international system is created which will put an end to the diplomatic struggle incident to the attempt of every nation to make itself secure. The real problem today is that of world government. Philip Kerr was a member of the Round Table. He wrote that in Foreign Affairs in 1922. And we could go on with a few more the the uh, quotations, but let's conclude here. There's a specter haunting our nation today. That specter grows ever darker and ever more ominous. Prospects for the survival of our freedom grow ever more distant. But now you know the story of the foundations of the network and their secret agenda. You, too, can become involved in the battle for the survival of Western civilization if you have the courage, if you have the integrity, if you have the character. The question is not whether or not we can restore to America to its greatness. The question is, are there enough men and women who will join together and pledge their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor in the most noble of all battles, that battle to determine whether this nation or any nation so conceived can long survive or so perish from the earth? What can you do? First, become educated. Purchase or borrow the recommended books, videotapes, and audio tapes, the materials available in Appendix 3. Second, come to understand that we're involved not simply in a political and ideological battle, we're involved in a spiritual battle, for indeed the forces that are aligned against freedom have a common thread, a common denominator. They oppose the concepts of Judeo-Christian religions, the concept upon which America was founded. They worship either no god or the gods of the New Age, frightening and mystical gods, whose powers originate in the occultic beliefs of centuries past. Whether it be the network or the corporate and banking elite, New Agers, Communists, Socialists, Satanists, Witches, Masons, or Theosophists, they all believe in an authoritarian socialist structure under world government. The God of the Bible intended that men should be free, for this was the message given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Follow my rules and you can be free. Tragically, evil in the form of the serpent intervened. You may not believe in the stories of the Bible. You may not even believe in the Jewish or Christian faiths. However, I can assure you, that once you become involved in this battle, you'll soon see the spiritual dimension, the spiritual nature of the struggle in which you have become involved, the struggle between truth and falsehood, between right and wrong, between light and darkness, between God and Satan, between Christ and the Antichrist. Having personally been involved in this battle for over 30 years, I can tell you that the deeper you delve into the hidden forces working within the shadows, the more you will come to realize the need for divine help and guidance. Third, you can... Because the network is sustained by control of the media, I hope you'll decide to support Radio Liberty, my nightly radio program to purchase airtime on small independent stations all across America before the network reintroduces some form of fairness legislation or censorship to silence all opposition. A monthly contribution will help spread the message of freedom across America and the world. We talk then about the importance of educating yourself and your community, avoiding the trap of Believing this is a Jewish or Catholic conspiracy, it is not. It is a conspiracy of evil men 
of no racial or, or religious conviction and last becoming politically involved and then finally de- determine whether you're willing to commit your life, your fortune and your sacred honor to this battle. The words of James Russell Lowell written a century and a half ago tell you of the threat to freedom. His work is echoed to us from decades past. I pray that you will ponder his writings until his words come to dominate your reverie, then become a thundering chorus on the lips of all men and all women who treasure liberty above security. I challenge you to read and reread his words until they become part of your everyday thoughts, your hopes, your dreams. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside till the multitudes make virtue of the faith they had denied. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet is truth alone tis strong. Though a portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch upon his own. The choice is yours. The future belongs to the brave, to the courageous, to those of integrity, those who value freedom above life itself. Why should you leave your comfortable life and become involved? Because if you do not become involved, you will surely lose your comfortable way of life. But beyond that, you owe it to the countless thousands of young Americans who died needlessly during this past century. You owe it to those who died in the frozen wastes of Siberia and the Chinese Gulag. You owe it to the victims of the communist and socialist network onslaught throughout the world. You owe it to those bequeathed freedom to us from generations past. To those who purchased our freedom with their suffering, with their blood and their lives. But most of all, you owe it to your children and the dream that they may one day live in a world where men and women have true liberty, where all can hold their heads erect, knowing they're free of oppression, where all recognize that freedom comes not from government, but comes from God. For a list of tapes by Dr. Stanley Monteith, you can write to P.O. Box 13. Santa Cruz, California, 95063. God bless you now. Goodbye.